Good morning. This is another day that the Lord has made. This is a special day in that it is resurrection morning. We thank God for rising early on Sunday morning. I am yours truly, Reverend Dr. Wesley L. Davis, Jr. I'm coming to you from the G2 Church, the greatest second missionary Baptist church located in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where the Reverend Dr. Steve Cottle is pastor. March the 31st, 2024. Our lesson is taken from Mark the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 8. Title of our lesson today is Life Beyond Death. Life Beyond Death. And if I were to ask that you would take a couple of points with you to remember, number one would be encountering the unexpected, verses one through five. And number two, an unexpected assignment, verses six through eight. Our key verse is taken, if you will, from the 16th chapter and verse six which said, don't be alarmed. Again, I'm reading from the NIV. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they have lain him. Let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Master, for resurrection morn. Had not been for resurrection morn, there would be no need for our being here. There would be no need to worship you. But we worship you because of the blood of Jesus. That blood that washed us white as snow. So that now we can come to thee under our own power. So we come to say thank you, Lord, and uh, we bless all of those who are here uh, in this sanctuary as well as those who are uh, listening to us on other devices. Pray that something will be said that would uplift someone who might be heavy burdened. We give you honor. We give you praise for the great things that thou hast done. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake that we pray. Let every heart say amen. Life Beyond Death. The author of the book of, Math of Mark is attributed it to John Mark, who was not an apostle but was close friends with several of the apostles. And historians believe that Mark's firsthand account is based primarily on his own teachings and recollections about Christ's ministry. Mark's theological purpose was to present Jesus as the Savior of the world, the Messiah. In spite of his being crucified and buried in a borrowed grave because this same Jesus rose from the grave to reign forever. Without Calvary and resurrection morning, there is no basis for Christian faith and thus no reason to believe in a life beyond death. Without the resurrection, Jesus is not who he says he is. And the apostles are all just fairy tale dreamers. Or they are just plain, outright liars. But the good news is that Jesus did rise on the third day. And because of this, he has vindicated, saved, and guaranteed us life beyond the grave for everyone who puts their trust in Jesus as their Savior. As we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, let us praise God for the hope of abundant life now and more abundantly, eternally with 
Jesus. That's something to shout about right there, that we will have abundant life, and that life will be with Jesus. Which moves me to my first point, encountering the unexpected. Verses 1 through 5. Verse 1 says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Jesus died and was buried during the Jewish Passover. And because of the upcoming Sabbath rest observance, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who had procured Jesus' body from Porteus Pilate, didn't have time to anoint his body as was custom. So they simply wrapped and buried him in Joseph's new tomb. The women who had watched Jesus' crucifixion and burial knew where they had placed him. So they collected spices after the Sabbath rest uh, and was going over intending to anoint Jesus' body as a sign of their love, devotion, and respect that they had for him. Yet, this intention on their part to anoint his body also informs us that they did not believe or perhaps did not understand his words when he said that he would rise again on the third day. We all have doubts every now and then. Things happen in our lives that make us take a step back and say, are we going in the right direction? But the Spirit speaks to our heart, and the Spirit says, yes, you're going in the right direction. Verse 2, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. This verse reveals to us the eagerness of the women to show their faithfulness to Jesus because it says that they went very early on the first day of the week, even though they went thinking that he was dead. The Jewish nation worshiped their Sabbath on Saturday back then. But because of and to commemorate Jesus' rising on the third day, the Sabbath was changed to Sunday, which is the first day of the week on most calendars today. Now, there are certain denominations who still worship their uh, Sabbath on Saturday, and, and, and yet the point is that you should not just worship Jesus on Sunday or in the particular Sunday, but worship him every day of the week. Don't just pick out a certain day. You know, we've heard that thing where uh, we are saint on Sunday and a sinner on Monday. Don't be like that. Be a saint every day of the week. Worship him every day. Says, uh, Sunday, if you will, is for us to come together and fellowship one another. Now, we worship God in the midst of that. But it is said in the Bible, it is good for us to come together. And that's what we do on Sunday morning. Verse 3 says, and they ask each other. Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? As they walked, the thought eventually dawned on them that a large stone had been placed in front of the tomb. And they began to ask one another, who was going to roll the stone away from the entrance so that they would be able to get into the tomb? They were apparently unaware that the tomb had been ordered to be completely sealed by Pontius Pilate, who also had guards posted around the tomb to ensure that no one 
would be able to get in and steal the body of Jesus. Now, certainly, none of the apostles would be able to help these women because in one form or another, all of them had fled or hidden themselves during Jesus' rest. Uh, you know, Brother Peter was bold enough when Jesus told him what was going to happen. He said, I'll go down with you, Lord. And the Lord had to grab him and, and tell him, said, before the day is out, you're going to deny me not once, not twice, but three times. Don't get bold. Remain humble. Pride, uh, a fall comes before pride. God doesn't want pride for people. God wants humble people. Uh, we got to remain humble because we don't know what the morrow might hold. Well, we don't even know what the day might bring. Uh, I, I, I bless uh, the name Reverend Lester, Harry K. Lester. And Harry K. Lester would say, you know, uh, he always walked with his head down. Somebody said, why you walk with your head down? He said, because I ain't got nothing to be proud of. All that I have, God gave it to me. And so I don't stick my chest out and walk with my head like I'm a bag of chips. So I walk humbly because I'm grateful to God. That's how we all ought to be. Verse 4, but when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Matthew's account out of the four Gospels is the only gospel that reveals how the stone was rolled away from the tomb in Matthew 28 and 2, where it says, The angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the tomb. Now, Mark, Luke, and John only report that the stone was no longer blocking the entrance to the tomb when the women arrived. Jesus, our angel and savior, promised his children that he would remove any stones that may be placed in your path to hinder you if you allow him to come into your heart as Lord and savior. Now, he did not say you might you would never have any problems, that trouble wouldn't come your way, even after you have received him, because that's what life is all about. We still have problems. We still have pain. We still have sicknesses. But in Jesus' name, we can get over those things. But this is what I want to talk about one of these days. At his return, we won't have to worry about any of those. Be no more pain, no more suffering, no more going up and down mountains and valleys. It'll be howdy, howdy, and never goodbye. We don't have to worry about losing our loved ones because death will have been done away with and cast into the lake of fire. Verse 5, as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Naturally, they were distressed and alarmed to find a young man dressed in white sitting on the right side of the burial chamber. Mark did not say that this young man was an angel. Uh, some of the other Gospels did, but under the circumstances, most theologians agree that this may have been an angelic messenger sent to deliver the upcoming message concerning Jesus to the women as they entered the tomb. What if they'd gone in and Jesus' body was gone and nobody was there to tell them what went on? What what? What would they have done then? See, it was good that this messenger was there. 
uh, the women along with the disciples apparently had not really understood Jesus' message that he would rise on the third day or they would not have made all of the preparations they had gone through in order to anoint his body, but would have gone in order to fall down before him and honor him as the risen Savior. If they had thought that uh, Jesus' words about if you tear this temple down, I'll rebuild it in three days, they thought he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem. But he was talking about his own body. And if they had thought that he was going to rise again, why bring the spices? They did not know, but didn't have a clue. You know, there are a lot of people out there don't have a clue that Jesus is coming back. Huh? They don't believe it. In fact, they don't believe in Jesus. And if you don't believe in Jesus, then you don't believe he's coming back. But I got news for you. You better get your house in order. Because one of these days, yeah, he's going to come like a thief in the night. So you better be ready. He's not going to come and say, y'all pack your bags. I'm on my way. He's just going to show up. And when he show up, there are going to be some that are going to rise. And there are going to be some that are going to go down. Which side are you going to be on? Point number two, an unexpected assignment, uh, verses 6 through 8. Verse 6 said, don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here Behold the place where they laid him. When the angel said, don't be alarmed, it had a dual meaning. Number one, the young man wanted to alleviate the natural fear that the women probably had upon seeing him sitting inside the tomb. Yeah, I, I, I would have been afraid too. I'm going in looking for a dead body and that... Who are you? Where you come from? So they were a little shook. And then second, his words assured the women that they were in the right tomb since they were there seeking Jesus. But he went on to inform them that Jesus had risen. And he was no longer there. He went even further, inviting them to look and see where Jesus had been placed so that they could see for themselves that he was not there. Now, other gospels mention his burial clothes, which were still there. And the thing about that is that the burial clothes were laid exactly how they would have been if he had been inside of them. So it looks as if he just came right up through the clothes. Now, somebody walk up to me and say, uh, uh, Dr. Davis, uh, can you explain that? No. I can't explain it. There are some things that we don't know. Huh? It, 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 it's not for us to know right now. Now, don't think now, when I get to heaven, I'm going to go up and ask God, I'm going to ask Jesus, why did that happen? But it is said that when Jesus come back and we rise and meet him in the air, we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye into what we know not yet, but we'll be just like him. Not only will we be just like him, but we'll know everything that he knows. And so all of those questions you have about why do little babies have to die? Why did my grandmama have to die, or my grandfather, or my mother? You won't have to ask the question because you will know. You will know as he knows. There are reasons why. I can't tell you. And I wish people would stop blaming God for a loved one's death. God ain't sitting up there killing folk. Huh? He ain't sitting up there saying, you know what, come on here, Sister David, come on home. That God, God, that ain't God, that's life. 
Huh? God would that all would live. And when he placed man in that garden, that was his expectations, that we would live forever. But one bite, one bite of the apple, or whatever it was, we don't really, we don't really know if it was an apple, we just claim it was an apple. We don't know what that fruit was. And here we are. It's not God's fault. It's our fault, huh? Because sin came in when they bit of that apple. And sin is going to be here until his return. You might as well uh, look for it. Then verse 7 says, but go tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. The young man instructed the women to go and tell Jesus' disciples and Peter to meet him in Galilee as he had previously told them to do in Mark 14 and 28. The angel's message would send the disciples back to where their relationship began with Jesus in Galilee. And sometimes I feel that... Uh, we would be much better off as Christians if every now and then we would look back and reflect on when we first met Jesus through the Holy Spirit and how it turned our life around. It's been a long time since we met Jesus and we've lost some of that fervor. I, I notice in the church, and, and I'm not trying to uh, throw stones at the church, but we don't worship like we used to worship. Huh? We, we don't sing like we, because you see, back then, uh, we didn't have much. Huh? We, 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 didn't, we didn't even lock our doors when we left the house because there wasn't nothing in there to steal. Come on in if you want to. We had a television sitting over there that only showed two channels, and one of them was fuzzy. Huh? Y'all remember them rabbit ears? Well, come on and steal it if you want to. But now we locking up. Huh? We scared to go out of our house. And we don't worship God like we used to. As the son said, we ought to go back. Every now and then, you ought to go back to where you first met the Lord. And remember that joy that you had. The joy that the world didn't give to you. The world can't take away. Just every now and then, think back to that day. Oh, I wish the church would catch on fire again because the church is growing dim. All these things that are assailing the church today. And we're just folding our arms. It's going to be all right. No, we got to get out there. We got to go. As he told his disciples. The disciples were all hanging around in Galilee, scared and everything. So he brought persecution to get them to run. To get them out of there. Don't, don't let them have to bring persecution to get you out there to tell somebody. If he's done anything for you, you ought to tell. He woke you up this morning. You ought to tell. Food. Tell. Clothes. Tell somebody. The gospel is dead if you don't tell somebody. Huh? That's what we're here for. Tell them about the goodness of the, oh, wait a minute. I got this on my own. I don't, I, I, he didn't have nothing to do with this. I, I went to school. I, no, if God hadn't have given you the strength, huh? I bought this house with my own money. If he hadn't have gave you the strength to go to work, to get the money, to back. Oh, come on, y'all. Every now and then, just think back to where he brought you from. And you'll be grateful for where you are. Now, the name of Peter 
who had denied even knowing Jesus, not once, but on three occasions after Jesus' arrest, was done so that he would understand that he had been restored to full fellowship with Christ in spite of his formal denials of Jesus. Listen, y'all. Even after we are saved, we still yet are prone to sin. Uh, for some of y'all, I, I need to put an S on that. Maybe. You know. I don't know. I, I started to put an S on it. You know, but I, I just... But if you ask God in Jesus' name to forgive you of that sin, he will forgive you in spite of your sin. Now, it is the blood of Jesus that will cover your sin. Now, don't get out and ask for forgiveness knowing that as soon as you get up, you're going to go right back. Huh? Uh, if you know you're going to do it, don't waste your time. You have to ask with a sincere heart. You actually, actually have to want the sin out of your life. Then he will remove it. Because, see, he knows your heart. He knows when you're down there shucking and jiving. I, I, I go, there are people out there that think, and you know Paul had to deal with this, that if I sin, I can sin as much as I want to. All I got to do is ask God for forgiveness. And Paul said, no, are we going to keep on sinning? He said, No. If God's Holy Spirit is in you, he will lead you away from sin. And anyway, uh, if you're going to sin, you ought to at least be sorry about it. Uh, <clears throat> Verse 8, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The women's reactions of trembling and being bewildered is understandable because nothing they were seeing or hearing made sense to them because they had stood and watched Jesus die on the cross as well as seeing others place his dead body in this very tomb. Now, they said nothing to anyone because they needed some time to process the news of Jesus' resurrection for themselves. The women eventually reported the news to the disciples who at first disregarded the news before finally becoming convinced that the news the women brought was undeniably true. It is now the church's responsibility, each and every, and I'm not talking about this building. This is just a structure that we call a church, but the church is each one of you, each one of us that have claimed Christ as our Savior. We are the church. So it is uh, the responsibility to proclaim the same message the young men told the women in the tomb to the world, and that is, he is risen. For those seeking hope amid life's uncertainties, heartbreaks, and frustration, the church must proclaim the he is risen message of Jesus Christ, not only on an annual resurrection calendar date, but proclaim and celebrate it daily throughout the year. It's good we set aside a resurrection day, but we need to worship him every day. And in my conclusion, our familiarity with the account of Christ's Resurrection must not dim our witness to the world that the risen Savior is our greatest source of present and future hope. Every believer should faithfully pledge themselves to pushing past reservations, disappointments, and even grief as the women at the tomb eventually did 
and share the good news of Christ's resurrection through our daily living and service to him as well as our service to our neighbors. How can you say that you love God and you hate your neighbor? You can't do it. How do we know that you are saved? is that you love the brethren. When I took my exam for my, my uh, license and my ordination, that's one of the questions they ask. How do you know you're saved? And people are going to talking about, well, I was shaking and I couldn't control. Them. No, because you love the brethren. Huh? You love your neighbor. Thank you. As you love yourself. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we praise you for the blessing of serving a risen Savior. As we celebrate the resurrection as our ultimate hope for the present and future, we commit to sharing this amazing message with others, striving to navigate life's uncertainties. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I was thought to remember that I hope you would take with you like the women at the tomb and as a child of the king you can obey the angel's command to share the good news to the world that he is risen. God bless you and God keep you is your servant's prayer.